Welcome to episode 15 of 100 Years of Marine Corps Tankers, a station dedicated to honoring the legacy of Marine tankers and remembering the stories of what made the community special, told through the words of those Marines that towed the line. It is my esteemed honor to introduce to this channel someone who I hold in the highest regard and someone who I've worked for on multiple occasions and someone who epitomizes, epitomizes what makes Marine Corps tankers special. Colonel Ron Storer, welcome to 100 Years of Marine Corps Tankers, sir. Thanks, JR. I appreciate it. Great opportunity. Thank you, sir. So let's rewind the time just a little bit and go back to August 16, 1988 and before. When you left for boot camp, did you enter the Marine Corps already knowing that you wanted to be a tanker? No, I actually, uh, you know, I, I had a bit of a hiccup. I was, uh, you know, be honest with you, JR, I was slated to join the Army as a combat engineer. And, uh, and when they started, you know, jerking me around on a contract, I walked out of their recruiting office and I saw a Marine staff sergeant throwing a pencil into the ceiling at the recruiting station, sitting behind his desk. And I thought, well, I'll go see what this guy's got to say. And I walked down there and, you know, he offered me the two things. You got an opportunity uh, and you may earn the title Marine. And I thought, you know what? You're not offering me 20 grand to join. I think I'm going to do this. And so, uh, so I did. And, and I originally, I was supposed to be a diesel mechanic. I had spent quite a bit of time working on engines in high school. Uh, it was something that, uh, that I thought, yeah, I could do that. Uh, and so uh, I went to boot camp as a, as a diesel mechanic. Uh, and it wasn't until I got to, to my first duty station that uh, things changed for me. And your first duty station you reported to was Charlie Company, 4th Tank Battalion in Boise, uh, where, you, where you were assigned as an 1811 M60 tank crewman. Oh, so, that's so right. So early on, sir, when you reported to your unit uh, before going to tank school, what were your early impressions of the tanker community? Well, I got to tell you, so when I checked in uh, to the INI there, you know, wide-eyed, bushy-tailed uh, PFC at a boot camp, ready to do whatever, uh, they, uh, the INI staff had a talk with me and said, hey, look, we're, we're over on mechanics. Uh, we need tankers. And I said, I didn't join to drive trucks. I joined to work on trucks. Uh, and he walked me down to the tank ramp and showed me the, the M60 tank. And he says, no, tanker. I'm like, oh, yeah, I can do that. I can do that. <laughs> so uh, changed it, you know, changed my, uh, changed my MOS and got me slated to go to tank school that next summer, uh, which would have been the summer of 90. Uh, but my early impressions, you know, being on the M60, uh, OJT authorized. So my first drill uh, is, uh, is now a uh, soon-to-be 1811 tank crewman. Uh, I, I realized the, uh, you know, the, the tanks were a small family. So uh, your tank crew was everything. And so I went through the standard, you know, go find me a box of grid squares and let's do some, uh, let's do some track qual, uh, you know, so uh, blindfolded repairing track, uh, but you don't know your, the thing you're slamming with the sledgehammer is your cover. Uh, so, you know, I, I went through uh, some of that time there, uh, in the late eighties, early nineties. Uh, but learn real quick, you know, it, it's the family atmosphere, which is hard to say as a, as, as a Marine, uh, but the family atmosphere inside the tank. I mean, you're all in it together. It takes the four crewmen to keep that thing moving. And it's all about move, shoot, and communicate. And if the tank can't do that and the crew can't function that way, you're not doing what you need to do on the battlefield. And then, and then so early on, it was that, that sense of family, that sense of community uh, that was just instilled in me. Uh, and I've maintained it to this day. Yes, sir. And then 91, Lance Corporal Store reported to uh, you, the unit that was activated and deployed to take part in Operation Desert Shield and Desert Storm. What are some of your early memories from tanks uh, being in, in Desert Shield and Desert Storm? I got to tell you, being, being a reservist mobilized, uh, we'll, we'll start there because it was quite interesting. So I graduated tank school, I think it was like August 4th of 91, you know, two days after Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait. So we were itching to get back to our units and see what was going on because our active duty counterparts that we were in tank school with were already getting orders. You know, mm -hmm. head to your units, you're going immediately. So we get back to Boise and, uh, you know, eight of us volunteered. Uh, and so we sat and hung out there at the local e-club, uh, shot the 45, recalled on the 45, uh, you know, got our gear issue, we were ready to go. And then, hey, go check into college, stand down, we're not gonna send you anywhere, right? So. So I stood down and I'm literally uh, in December, I'm in Salt Lake City Airport seeing my brother off who had joined the army uh, that, 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 uh, in 90 uh, and joined the army. And uh, he was heading overseas as a combat engineer. 
uh, as a reservist. Uh, he was deploying, and I'm like, oh, man, I can't believe my younger brother is going to beat me. <laughs> then there's a voice over the intercom of the airport. Lance Corporal Store, please report to a courtesy phone for a message. I'm like, what? <laughs> so I, I get to a courtesy phone. It was like, hey, get back to Boise. We're mobilizing. Uh, no joke. So I, wow. I, I headed out of Salt Lake City, uh, uh, told my parents goodbye, and headed down to Boise. And, uh, and sure enough, we were mobilizing December 17th. Uh, we were headed uh, headed down to 29 Palms. And so, uh, you know, for us as an M60 company, uh, our first task was you guys were going to be a mine, a mine clearing company uh, to reinforce Second Marine Division. So, you know, we had drawn third tanks, tanks that they had left uh, throughout the, the corridor here in 29 Palms uh, and, and what was left on the ramp that they didn't part out and take with them. <laughs> we're putting tanks together, getting them back to work and uh, and it was probably 10 days into maintenance cycle uh, and training cycle that they uh, had us pull the tanks all back <clears throat> and, uh, and told us we were going through M1A1 net training. Uh, so so uh, ourselves and our sister company, Bravo Company at Yakima, we were both down here in 29 Palms. And then Bravo went through first 20 days of training, uh, got their certificates. And then Charlie went through, and we got ours. So by the end of January, uh, we were trained on the M1 uh, Abrams, uh, you know, our 20 days of training because a, a, tank's, a tank's a tank. It's got a gun and an engine and uh, takes four crewmen to run it. So you get going. So, uh, uh, but my earliest, uh, you know, getting into country in Ajabel, uh there in Saudi Arabia and offloading tanks off ships, it was, you know, I, I drew a tank that had eight hours on it. So I was a driver, driver on an M1 Abrams, uh, eight hours of operations. It was a different model because it had a combat override that I had to make sure I didn't grab uh, that would force fuel into the engine. So we, we started safety wiring all those things down so we weren't going to, uh, you know, in the heat of the moment, grab the wrong, uh, grab the wrong handle um, down there next to the uh, crew seat. Uh, when we had the seats in the tanks, you had the, uh, the uh, crew seat lever uh, next to it. But, uh, but it, was the, it, was, it was just the... The ability of the tank, you know, even with, and we, we fired no ammunition before we LD'd. Mm -hmm. So everything was fleet zeros. So, I mean, we had literally no time. We got the, got the tanks, got on some jingle trucks, carted them up to the LD point, loaded up with ammo, and then, and then pressed with the LD uh, on the 24th. And so uh, I think the, the quietness of the vehicle, uh, the lack of, of really maintenance uh, that the vehicle required coming off the boat. I mean, it was a standard, you know, as a driver, I slept with my grease gun. So mm -hmm. I was always greasing track at one point or another. Uh, but then the capabilities of the tank, uh, I mean, it just, it just out, it outdid what we were faced against. And, and we didn't know what we were up against, right? I mean, we were told 80% of us weren't coming back mm -hmm. uh, before we executed LD on the 24th of February. So, you know, it was, uh, it was unknown to us. Uh, then in 91. Uh, but after our first couple engagements of BMPs and, and those kinds of things, it was clear that they were no match for what we were laying down with the, with the Abrams tank. No, that's amazing, sir. And, and just, just going back and thinking about taking the MPF off. I mean, obviously that operation was probably, you know, infant, infant at best, you know, and, and having yeah. the experience to be able to do that and then, and then go immediately into combat. I mean, it's, that's an amazing experience. That yeah, takes well, us up. That didn't help. You had, the, you had the Scud missiles every night, so you were waiting for the fireworks at any chance. Uh, kept your gas mask near you at all times. Uh, you know, so it was, as a 19-year-old, it was definitely different. Uh, and, you know, something you just dealt with. It was day-to-day. -day. There wasn't cell phones. You didn't get mail. Uh, you know, uh, AT&T didn't have trailers everywhere, so it was, it was definitely different, uh, you know. Uh, it's what you read about in history class kind of deployment. Yes, sir. That takes us to 1995, where uh, you served with Charlie Company uh, still, and then you graduated from, from Boise State with a bachelor's degree in histories, history and a minor's in political science and sociology, and with, all, with also an associate degree in criminal justice and law enforcement. And then Sergeant Storer reported to Quantico, Virginia, and attended officer candidate school during the summer of 1996. Uh, what made you want to become an officer, sir? Well, I'll be honest with you. I, you know, I, I was uh, so I was a graduate uh, with with two degrees, a, a BA and a, and a BS, 
or a, a, a associates and a, and a and a bachelor's. And at the time, so we're talking ninety five. So federal hiring had frozen. I had interviewed with the U.S. Marshals. I'd interviewed with the FBI. I interviewed with the Secret Service. All uh, all made it to you know the third and fourth interviews. I was through the psychological evals and and everything. I was well on my way to to going into law enforcement. And uh, and then everything froze. And uh, my I and I, Major Scott West, pulled me aside and said, "You know what, Story? You you should think about taking a commission." I'm like, "Well, I did. I thought about it. I mean, that's how I I kind of thought I'd, I'd become a commission officer uh, the whole time I was being enlisted." Uh, but you know, I was like, "Well, I already got my T-shirt from Desert Storm. Kind of did my time. I mean, that's uh, you know, I don't know. It's uh, and and by now, by '95, I'd gotten married. Mm-hmm. So uh, and so it was like, okay, well, I don't know, maybe." And I talked to the OSO, and uh, so he he pushed my paper along, if you will. Uh, so you know, uh, I, I I knew he was doing it, but I wasn't. It wasn't something I was tracking. And then uh, one day I get a letter in the mail. Congratulations, report to OCS. You know, so now I'm 27. I'm like, what the hell just happened? I gotta go back to boot camp. And so uh, so you know, so that summer uh, of uh, of '96. Uh, I report to OCS and uh, and and uh, and begin again. Uh, mm-hmm. But but you know OCS was different. I mean, eighty percent of my OCS class were all prior service, mm-hmm. so we had everything from mass sergeants down to sergeants, uh, and all of us were most of us were Desert Storm veterans. And so uh, you know when when the sergeant instructors are yelling at you with their three ribbons, it's like yeah, that's cute. All right, <laughs> yeah, I'll worry about it later. Thanks, uh, which you know well. Uh, you know, so it's, uh, it's like, okay, great. Uh, but, you know, met some great guys, some lifelong friends at OCS, uh, moving into TBS. Uh, just, uh, and, and, you know, even at 27, you know, you lock in and you do it. I mean, it's just what Marines do. So, so we got, we got focused and, uh, and it was good. It was a good 10 weeks. Uh, you know, the first two weeks are, uh, you know, uh, like boot camp, and then the other eight weeks are not like boot camp, right? Mm-hmm. The weekends off and time to think, time away from the yelling uh, and the trash can games. Uh, but uh, no, but it was uh, it was a great experience. So I know there's a story. It was in 1997 when you graduated from the, the basic school. You drew tanks. You drew you drew the MOS of 1802. So yeah. how coming out of TBS, sir, did you draw tanks after being a uh, enlisted tanker? <laughs> well, as the story goes, right. So. Uh, at the time, the TBS uh, uh, commander uh, had asked all of his companies, you know, hey, your prior service guys that have combat action in their MOS, uh, we need to we need to pay attention to where where these guys end up. And so, uh, so it was uh, it was not lost on us that uh, that we would have an opportunity to get our MOS uh, if that's what we wanted to stay into. So we made our company commanders aware of it uh, for the for the colonel uh, there at the school. Uh, you know, but the day of, the day of, you know, I get, uh, I get the uh, store 0180. You made it it's like 0180. What the hell is that? Uh, and an adjutant, I'm like, yeah, you're done here. Take these things. I'm out. <laughs> you know, and, uh, and so they were just, there's, they, they were making fun. So 18, uh, 1802 is what I was going for. And, uh, and that's what I got leaving TBS. And then, uh, you know, I didn't get a chance because of the school cycle. I didn't go through TBS graduation. So I had to mm-hmm. beat feet out of there and report over to uh, Fort Knox, uh, get into that next school uh, a bit early. Uh, so I left after all the shenanigans and carrier quals at TBS. Uh, didn't have to do all the left left knee, or left hand, right knee, that kind of stuff. I was able to get out of there and get over to Fort Knox and get, get back to work. And that was the summer of 1997 where uh, you then completed Armor Basic Armor Officer Basic Course as well as a st- scout platoon leaders course. And then immediately uh, checked into second tank battalion, second Marine division over there in Camp Lejeune, North Carolina. While at second tanks, uh, you ran the gamut of, of billets uh, as an officer. You uh, started out as an M1A1 tank platoon commander and then the tank company executive officer, AT tow, which is anti-tank tow platoon commander, and then also commanded a tank uh, company. So you, uh, you ran the table there. Um, and then after completing uh, your, your three years at Second Take Battalion, First Lieutenant Store executed orders to Marine Corps Warfighting Laboratory, which is a uh, very interesting billet because um, you worked on Project Metropolis over there in Quantico, Virginia. So, sir, I'm going to ask you, what, what was Project Metropolis? 
Yeah, sure. So Project Metropolis, uh, the, the whole theory behind it out of the warfighting lab was trying to reduce casualties uh, in an urban environment. At the time, the Marine Corps had the lead for urban warfare doctrine. So other than bypass, which had been written in our doctrine, we wanted to find a way that uh, we could fight through the city effectively, because what we were seeing and what we're seeing today is, is our numbers that we were using then that 80% of the world's population is moving towards cities that are lo located in the littoral regions. So it was a concern then, just like it's a concern now, uh, needing to fight through uh, an urbanized area uh, from the sea. So, uh, so actually as a Lieutenant, I had been tasked as, with my platoon, we spent weeks in the field uh, uh, and uh, we worked for the warfighting lab uh, with different infantry battalions, trying to work on infantry tank integration and how we could function together uh, because we didn't have things like a tank phone, right? So mm -hmm. we made things out of uh, ammo cans and uh, and strip wire. Matter of fact, I gave I gave two of my two com kids out of the company 400 bucks and said, make this work better. <laughs> you know, and they went to Radio Shack, uh, went through the Dermo bin, got handsets, uh, uh, but you know, built bus terminals to go in the yo-yo cords. So that we could actually talk better with the tanks uh, before we had the uh, the tank infantry phone that uh, that we've got or that we had uh, on the M1 Abrams, you know, because the tank was never designed for that. You know, the tank was designed for that full to gap action in Europe. Uh, was not designed for close in infantry uh, requiring or asking for assistance right there on your back. So, uh, but we found we had to create those things to lessen the casualties, uh, bring that casualty number down. So it was something that was sustainable uh, for the force. So that became kind of the focus of Project Metropolis. So while I was at the warfighting lab, uh, so as a Lieutenant, I did all that uh, for a year before I left to become the XO at Charlie Company. And then uh, when it came time for orders, uh, those popped up and General Donovan, uh, tank general was just turning over the warfighting lab, but specifically asked for me to come up to be a part of the team there, Project Metropolis, working for a retired Colonel Randy Gangle uh, and a British Lieutenant Colonel, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Beden, uh, Beden out of the British Royal Marines. So I turned to and, and uh, went to work up there at the warfighting lab. Uh, me and another captain, uh, engineer, uh, Captain Tyler Bush, we, uh, we ran the writing of the basic urban skills training. Uh, and, the, and the teaching of those skills uh, to different outfits that we would drag out to Victorville and uh, make them fight through the Victorville Air, or the old Air Force Base housing. Uh, we would test all our theories uh, with, uh, with small mag tests, if you will, uh, and, and making sure we could number buildings, pass it to aircraft, utilize all those techniques, uh, which actually became pretty important. Uh, you know, fast forward a couple of years, uh, it became vitally important uh, when you're fighting through areas like Nazaria and Numenaya, uh, you know, uh, Baghdad or Fallujah. Yes, sir. So 2002, when you went back to Fort Knox because you're glutton for punishment uh, and attended the Armor Captain's Career Course. From Project Metropolis and, and moving backwards and then forwards uh, to your enlisted time and then also as your officer time, uh, how did you, or how do you think that being a tanker assisted you uh, up, up until this point? Well, I think, uh, you know, again, the, the community, you know, I don't think you can find a tanker that isn't, isn't respected, whether enlisted or officer, based on their knowledge. And tanks, as a, we all know it, as a supporting element, we pride ourselves on knowing more about the MAGTAF than our counterparts, just because we're supporting uh, the base portion of the MAGTAF. So you got to know where you can get things, whether it's Hydraulic hoses made over at the over at the ACE compound, or or it's uh, you know how to how to help infantry understand you know 500 gallons of fuel doesn't equate to a five gallon can, so you know it's it's those kinds of things that uh, that tankers pride themselves on, and so for me it was the it was uh, specifically going through armor officer or uh, uh, maneuver captain's career course there at Fort Knox, it, it was being able to uh, function as a as a MAGTAP officer with the army armor officers and making sure that they understood, you know, we, even though I'm a tanker in the Marine Corps, I have a broader responsibility to be a MAGDAF officer and, and understand, understand what the total force is, is able to achieve 
uh, provided it has all its all its attachments uh, and things that it, it's required to to achieve the mission. Um, you know, the second piece would be just having been an enlisted tanker. You know, I was the Lance Corporal cleaning battlefields up. I was the Lance Corporal stirring the honey pots with diesel out there in '91. So asking my guys to do things that uh, that uh, I had already done was easy. And so being able to have those talks, hell, I was the freaking selective unmasked guy in 91 for my platoon when the NBC alarms went off, right? So talk about paranoid standing there with a the atropine injector with your on your right hand and waiting to see if you start doing the funky chicken uh, while all your, your teammates are staring at you. Uh, it's, uh, it's quite, it, you know, it's one of those experiences that, okay, I've lived it. Now I know what it's going to take to ask guys to do it uh, when I have to make that transition. And so for me, it was, uh, you know, it just became kind of a, a cornerstone of my, my leadership principles as an individual. And then I've just maintained them. Yes, sir. And uh, I got to have the experience of working under you and, and realizing that that's exactly who you are. And uh, it, uh, it was, you know, quite a pleasure. Uh, completing the course in 2002, uh, Captain Storer, then you reported to 2nd Tank Battalion again uh, in support of 2MEF, where then uh, you served uh, in Operation Iraqi Freedom. So uh, uh, interestingly enough, your project Metropolis uh, time now came to fruition and now you're living pretty much what you, uh, what you wrote. Um, and then as the assistant operations officer for the battalion, and then April 4, 2003, outside of Baghdad, uh, you assumed company uh, C, which is Charlie Company, second tank battalion, uh, as a battlefield uh, replacement, I assume. Is there a story behind that, sir? Yeah, so April 3rd was a long day, right? So, uh, you know, the battalion, we had uh, fought through Numenia uh, uh, and uh, taken the drawbridge we needed to to get across the river. Uh, and then uh, April 3rd, we were pushing to the outskirts of Baghdad. Uh, I was still playing the Zulu, so I was in the command track with the three, and, and my job uh, uh, as the Zulu was to make sure that vehicle was in a place where, you know, the three command and control the, the fight for the, for the boss, uh, for Colonel Ole there. And so, so I was maneuvering that track where I could. Charlie Company was the lead company uh, behind Scouts. Um, scouts got hit first, uh, and then Charlie Company uh, got hit. And when uh, Charlie Company Commander, uh, you know, Captain Jeff Houston's uh, fuel bladders got penetrated and, and leaked into the pre-cleaner, caught his tank on fire, caused them to abandon their vehicle. Uh, and then that's when Jeff got hit uh, and uh, was, uh, was evacuated. Uh, we fought, you know, the, the battalion fought through that fight uh, with all its casualties and everything. Uh, and then that night, the battalion commander was like, hey, store, you're... We're, pull, we're pulling you off the track. You're going down to Charlie Company. You go link up with them. And so, as a company commander, you know, I, as a, you know, the, I didn't know any of the guys in the units. Um, and uh, I, I checked in with the first sergeant. And uh, first thing I signed was uh, Corporal Bernard Gooden's letter uh, for his mother and uh, helped the first sergeant pack uh, uh, Corporal Gooden's gear up and get it out of there uh, because he'd been a casualty on April 3rd. So that was, uh, so I had to, I had to quickly, you know, it's just stuff you read about. It's not stuff you go, you go to TBS for or anything else. So uh, I had to make my way around the tanks uh, and, uh, and start talking to the crews and start giving guidance and start figuring out who I've got on the team. Cause at that point I really didn't know. Uh, and so that, that, that took, uh, luckily we had a lull. So the fourth was a lull for us as we're waiting for a ribbon bridge to show up and everything else. Gave me an opportunity to figure out who I had, you know, who's who in the zoo, who are the lieutenants, you know, trying to find out who Dan Hughes is and Aaron Smithley and Mark Markley and uh, trying to figure out who all those cats are. Uh, and then staff NCOs like, uh, like you know, staff Sergeant Bankus uh, and staff Sergeant Hilliard, uh, trying to figure out who all they are. And, uh, and then Master Sergeant Meek, uh, can't forget, uh, can't forget me. So trying to figure out who the team is, uh, so I can talk to them and get ready for the next day because there's no rest. So uh, you're just prepping, uh, refitting, rearming, and getting back in the fight. And so I gave some very, uh, very limited guidance uh, from my position where I came from, uh, and started to, uh, you know, started to command. Uh, and then from there we uh, we pressed through, uh, and I was able to bring uh, the rest of them back. Um, after our stint uh, 
crossing over into Baghdad, dealing with issues there in Baghdad and heading back down to Diwania after Easter. Yes, sir. And 15 months later, you relinquished command J J July 2004, uh, where you were then assigned as the S-4 logistics officer for, for 2nd Tank Battalion. And you already spoke hardest on it, day. sir, but- I'm... Hardest day of my life, JR. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. I remember uh, you tried to give me that duty and I think I skated it for a little bit. So uh, well, <laughs> uh, how, prepared, how prepared were you uh, for, um, I guess, the command and, and then ultimately being a logistics officer? And, and I guess the following question would that be, would be, what were some of the challenges you need to overcome? I think the command, you know, I think, I think education wise, you know, I mean, I'd, I'd been to a captain's career course, I'd done EWS phase one, you know, I'd, I had luckily for me, I'd been a Lieutenant company commander, uh, you know, I had Delta company, the Mew company uh, for second tanks. So I, I had an idea of what needed to happen. Uh, certainly the circumstances were different you know, uh, the, you know, taking over a command where the commander's been wounded in evac, uh, a, uh, the FAC had been wounded in evac, uh, one loader had been killed. Um, you know, it, it, uh, you gotta, you gotta pick up the pieces and, and you know, you gotta move out and draw fire. So, uh, trying to instill uh, a sense of, of, I, I, you know, felt their pain, uh, a little bit tougher with, uh, Markley's crew, cause that's, uh, Gooden's tank. Uh, but, you know, during Desert Storm, I, I was the Lance Corporal that had to clean the, uh, the blood out of uh, blood and brain matter out of a tank uh, from a tank commander we had lost during 91. So uh, it wasn't something, again, I was asking them to do something I had already done. Mm -hmm. And so I, I didn't feel bad doing it, although the, I think the chaplain felt I was uh, crass and, uh, and unfeeling. Uh, but they, uh, you know, they needed to be back in the fight. And so uh, I gave my task. I gave the purpose. Uh, and, and made sure that their, their game faces were on. And, and that's what I felt like I needed to do at the time. I think the, the hardest thing though was, you know, being in a battalion where I think there were three of us that were combat veterans uh, going into OIF-1, coming out of OIF-1, uh, you're, you're trying to talk to 120 Marines uh, who have just witnessed the ugly side of humanity and are trying to wrestle with how do you deal with that. And so I took the time to sit down with, uh, you know, the whole group and talk it out. And, uh, you know, I, to this day, I, I'll tell you that saved me uh, the pain on the back end because uh, I opened it up and said, look, you're going to be different and you're going to need to deal with it. You know, the tank eats meat, doesn't care whose meat it is. And you got to be pre prepared to deal with what that picture is. So being able to uh, talk to the entire company uh, with an open door policy, uh, getting those Marines that wanted to talk to somebody, uh, somebody to talk to, really in my mind paid dividends down the road and it showed for the next 15 months I, I did not have the problems the other companies had in my opinion uh and and uh i was producing a a company that was more than capable of redeploying in 2004 uh, for the fight that laid ahead of them uh even with getting new guys in right i mean and i think that was that was probably one of the bigger challenges as you come back to the states from deployment you get 10 new marines in mm -hmm. 88 you get 10 new guys in you know, 10 or 15 are leaving. Uh, and then it's uh, the haves and the have nots, right? So how do you create an environment where the have nots, those new kids uh, get brought into the family fold uh, without shenanigans? And so I took it upon myself. I took, the, I took the Marines, I dismounted them off tanks. I took them all to the mount facility. We created new war stories. So we spent a week out there using simunition, shooting each other and creating new war stories and bringing the crew together as a family. Uh, and I think that went a long way uh, to building the tanks up, getting out to the next gunnery, getting out to CACs, uh, and, uh, and moving them forward for, uh, for Rob Bodish to take them uh, and do business over in Fallujah. Yes, sir. And then July 2005, uh, you transitioned from 2nd Tank Battalion to report to 4th Tank Battalion, uh, 4th Marine Division, as the inspector instructor for Charlie Company, 4th Tank Battalion, uh, once again in Boise, Idaho. So everything kind of comes full circle. Um, having uh, started your career out there, now as a captain going back there. Um, well, as a reserve tanker, now an inspector instructor, what were some of your goals for the company? Yeah, so for the for the company, so it was unique, right? So uh, I got there and the company was already deployed. So uh, part of the company was deployed as uh, tank platoons. And then uh, the bulk of the company was deployed as, uh, as uh, convoy security. So they were already forward. 
So I got there and uh, and immediately had to deal with uh, actually the week I was I was moving across. They got hit pretty hard uh, and had a casualty. Uh, unfortunately, uh, had to take care of a Keiko call, uh, and then I started tracking a couple of Marines that had been uh, seriously injured. Um, and so uh, that became my focus uh, when I first checked in. That, among other things, uh, getting the tank company set up again as a tank company, as it, it looked like it had become an auto parts store. So, uh, so uh, having been a four at the second tanks for a year of my life, I won't get back. Uh, you know, prepared me extremely well for being an I and I, uh, and uh, jumping in at a company level where you only got, you know, 14 or 15 Marines and a sailor, and you're pulling the weight of a battalion. Uh, needing to maintain, you know, everything in the maintenance uh, maintenance realm, and then the armory, the training, uh, all of that's got to be kept up. So, so uh, you know that that transitioned well. And so when the company got back, uh, became a rebuilding action, right? So, mm-hmm. although unlike active component companies where the Marines get back and they, they've made their deployments, they move on, they come, you know, they move on to other they PCS, you don't have that in the reserve. So. We were able to retain, I would say, about 90 percent of the reservists to retain themselves in Boise, and, and Boise had been a you know has been a strong unit forever. So mm-hmm. it was not lost on me that the uh, that that those crews were were just you know younger than me, uh, but were the same same guys that came back in '91. So uh, we focused on uh, similar to what I'd done as uh, as the uh, company commander coming back from OIF one. Uh, got with the company commander there uh, before he uh, he relinquished command to me, and uh, and made sure that we were getting all the proper help for the Marines uh, as they were coming back, and then uh, and then made sure that we had a training schedule set up uh, because you know as reservists they're going to be drilled out, so you gotta you gotta kind of keep an even pace with their with their drill periods, uh, and and build a schedule that's amenable for them to maintain scores and quals. Uh, at the same time, not uh, take them away from their families for a month at a time to do a Moroccan lion or something like that, taking them overseas for something. So it was a, it was a, you had to strike a balance. Uh, and, you know, lucky for me, you know, as a, as a captain going back home, you know, first time Marinka was going to send me home for three years. So I'll take it for what it is. But, you know, the, the reserve first sergeant and I were corporals, uh, Lance corporals together during Desert Storm. Uh, the warrant officers that were still a part of the unit as tank platoon commanders uh, were uh, were Desert Storm veterans with me. So uh, it, easily to fall back in as an I and I now as a captain, um, you know, easy to fall back in and and uh, have the trust and the confidence of the leadership that was already with the Marines of the company uh, because my name was already on a plaque in the building. You know, the stories of uh, of Lance Corporal store to Sergeant store were already running amok on who the new <laughs> I and I was. So, uh, you know, it was, uh, but it, it was a good uh, good homecoming for me. And uh, I'd like to think, you know, I got them ready for the next uh, the next big hurdle after they came back from uh, uh, from that deployment in two thousand and five. Yes, sir. Now I understand why you're so hard on me when I had Alpha Company, right? <laughs> Uh, October 2006, it promoted the major, and then July 2008, uh, you attended Marine Corps Command and Staff College, graduating with a master's in military studies in 2009. Yeah, I'm not uh, sure how that happened, but you're right, I have the piece of paper. <laughs> <laughs> that's when you received orders to uh, 1st Tank Battalion as the uh, battalion executive officer, and this is where our, our uh, paths cross. Yeah. Uh, during this time, you served as the DXO uh, for the Black Sea Rotational Force in 2010, spent four months in the Black Sea uh, conducting theater security cooperation. And then in yeah. December of uh, 2010, uh, you, you led a small team of Marines into Afghanistan to establish the first tank company in support of OEF, uh, all the way back in 2010. Uh, what were some of the early challenges with USMC tanks in support of OEF? Yeah, well, getting them into a landlocked country. Uh, I think, uh, you know, I was literally, you know, Colonel Tom Gordon uh, had the battalion. We were out in the field. I was uh, sitting in the COC and I, I got a phone call from the rear just typically not what you want to have. Uh, and, uh, and they're like, hey, get back, check zipper. Okay, uh, hold on, we're in the middle of a field operation, day three, by the way, so uh, we'll, you know, I'll, I'll get to it. No, you gotta go now. Okay, so, uh, you know, I, I back up uh, uh, Master Arnold a lot and we head back and uh, actually I took uh, Martin Lopez, 
uh, and we're looking at this tasker uh, and it's, you know, develop and deploy tank company uh, to Afghanistan. It's like, what, what do you want me to do? And so uh, we start trying to pull this thing apart. It's like, okay, well, what's already in country uh, or what's close? Uh, and then what are the deficits? And so, uh, you know, building a tank company for a specific mission. Uh, so CENTCOM had provided that mission. We were able to to build out what we needed to support the tank company uh, based on how it was going to be employed. So uh, we had the list, we had the concurrence of the COCOM, and we had one MEF support. And so uh, me and me and five Marines, right? So so me, Mass Sergeant Lott, uh, Chief Officer uh, Lopez, uh, you know, Corporal Osler, great mechanic. Uh, uh, I think it's uh, Stube, Stubey, uh, another mechanic. I can't, I can't remember the uh, couple of the other kids' names, but we all board commercial aircraft and fly to Baltimore and, and catch a flight out of Baltimore into Germany and make our trek into Tajikistan and get a C-130 and uh, fly into Afghanistan where we're met by the headquarters company commander for Bella Wood. And, uh, you know, we, we link up with him and, and we start building. And so uh, units were tasked to bring us equipment in a specific code. Uh, which, uh, you know, in any battlefield is, is uh, hard to find code A equipment. So we, we took what we could and, uh, and got things established uh, as far as maintenance kits and, and everything else. We had shipped uh, some of our own equipment as we established this unit. Um, but then it was, you know, working with Albany uh, and the PM shop, getting the tanks uh, loaded on uh, aircraft one at a time and then flying them right into Bastion. Uh, where we offloaded them working with a contractor applied the belly armor the 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 uh, swing seats for the drivers all the uh, ied uh, detection equipment or you know the uh, the uh, the freaking uh, em emitters you know getting all that wired in you know kind of like something off of apollo 13 making sure you don't burn home or amp out of the system uh, so the tank can still function and then uh, and you know building 17 of them so one tank at a time, um, you know, and, and, uh, and putting them all together and getting them ready for the tank company that was coming in in January, February timeframe. So we were there uh, December through uh, February, uh, getting those things all put on the ground, uh, getting them outfitted. Uh, when the company rolled in, uh, they had all their equipment uh, and they, you know, we'd even uh, carved out a parking lot for them there amongst Bastion uh, and, and uh, were able to get them going. Uh, and it was great. Uh, it was great to hear the chatter, uh, you know, after the fact, uh, the enemy's panic uh, as tanks were rolling north and uh, and coming into the fight because they had actually thought the LAV uh, had been the uh, the tank in the area. And when our boys rolled in there, it uh, kind of changed the battlefield a little bit. Yes, sir. Incredible work there. I mean, just incredible. July 2011, Major Store, uh, you reported to duty at Marine Corps. Tactics Operations Group, 29 Palms, California, McTogg, uh, where you worked as the current operations officer, the exercise control officer, and then the instructor group for the officer in charge. Uh, filling these billets, uh, you then developed exercises for battalion and regional staffs training in support of OEF, Operation Enduring Freedom Deployments, and crisis response. Uh, while serving these duties, you acted as a mentor to over 200 operations, intelligence, and tactics instructor students managed all four periods of instruction as a formal schools manager. Obviously this was, uh, was quite a daunting task, sir. How do you think your experience as a tank officer enabled you to critique these senior staffs in execution of your duties? Well, I, you know, it goes back to one of my earlier comments, JR, where we, you know, we as tankers, you know, whether enlisted or officer, pride ourselves on knowing the MAGTAF better than, better than most. And so having that, that institutional knowledge of how the MAGTAF is supposed to operate uh, translated pretty easily when you're working with regiments uh, or battalions that are supporting MAGTAFs uh, in, in understanding their command and control, uh, you know, creating synergy between their intelligence and operations sections uh, and the reasons why to answer those critical commander information requirements. So uh, that became the drive, you know, um, for me, you know, I started out as, as the, uh, the guy trying to get uh, students to, you know, show up to our uh, our courses in the current operations realm, uh, and then uh, you know, as 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 need need arose, 
uh, quickly jumped on hand grenades and, and started taking more ownership of things, which led me to running the exercise uh, in total uh, for both the schoolhouse as well as uh, those, uh, uh, you know, uh, battle staff training events uh, for those units, uh, which focused me to, you know, literally make three more trips to Afghanistan, uh, sit on watch floors, watch how units were functioning so I could take all those, all those items back and make a more robust exercise for the units that were about to uh, jump in and, and be over there in Afghanistan. So provided me uh, a, a window, if you will, uh, into what they were gonna need to do instead of just reading about it in a book. Um, but then uh, that led to uh, you know a complete retooling of how we conducted our instruction uh, and the task of becoming the instructor group OIC and running uh, all the instruction, which included at that point, then the battle staff training, uh, for which I grabbed, you know, guys like, you know, uh, uh, Manny Herrera and uh, Ben Adams to uh, lead the charge on while I focused on the uh, formal formal courses and bringing them along in their life cycle and getting those POIs approved, um, all, all by, you know, retooling the way we conducted instruction. So bringing adult learning methodology into the program so we could use more of the students' own experiences to drive the education, uh, which you know nine times out of ten is key. Because if you can't relate to the students or you can't relate to their experiences, they don't retain what you're asking them to do, um, and it doesn't resonate with them. So we found that uh, by by making those adjustments, we were able to make a better product for the Marine Corps. Yes, sir. And then 2013, August 1st, you were promoted to lieutenant colonel. And then ultimately selected for command uh, a month later uh, after that. And 21 uh, of the longest months, JR. 21 <laughs> months waiting to pin on Lieutenant Colonel. I'll be honest with you. It was <laughs> yes, rough. Sir. And as the I and I for uh, Fourth Tank Battalion, Inspector Instructor for Fourth Tank Battalion, Fourth Marine Division uh, from July 2014 to 16. Uh, that's where uh, I'm gonna break, I'm gonna break uh, protocol here for a moment, sir. I usually don't tell personal stories, but uh, I think this one is is definitely worth telling. So uh, there we are in 29 Palms, my wife and my family and I, and I go to meet with the monitor. And the monitor says, after spending five and a half years here, we're going to give you orders back to first tanks to stay here for another three years. To which my wife replied, absolutely not. It's either me or the Marine Corps. So as a good, as a good husband, I uh, decided to tell the monitor no. I don't know how you found out about it, sir, but shortly after that, I get a phone call. JR, what are you doing? So I just told the monitor no. Yeah, that's not going to work. Uh, right. You need to come work for me. So because of you, sir, and because of you giving me the opportunity to be your Alpha I and I, uh, you kept me in the Marine Corps and you kept me uh, all the way through till, till today. So for that reason, sir, I want to say a personal thank you to you. No, no. I, I, I just needed to push you, JR. It was already there. I just needed to, well, maybe drag you. Uh, but, uh, you know, again, uh, one of those best decisions ever made because uh, Alpha couldn't have been in better hands at the time it needed it uh, with you in the leadership position down there. Uh, in uh, at uh, Pendleton. Well, thank you, sir. 2016, you were then selected for top level school where you attended the Army uh, College, graduating with a Master's of Strategic Studies in 2017 of June. Uh, what was your busy, big, biggest success story as the fourth tank battalion inspector instructor? Well, I think, uh, I think it was forming the team. I mean, you know, being an INI is no easy task. Uh, having, having six tank companies and a tow and scout unit uh, in six states, three time zones, trying to get everybody on a single page of music is not easy. And so taking what I'd learned about uh, and taught about command and control, I took a page out of that book uh, and just, you know, went to work. And so building the team, understanding the INIs are a customer, uh, the battalion needed to support and, uh, and kind of creating that environment where, you know, you know, don't, don't keep things to yourself, treat it like a small scorpion bite, you know, let somebody know. So it was, uh, but it was really forming the team and then the vision, uh, getting everybody onto the same vision of, you know, the readiness trail. So training, mobilization, maintenance, all those readiness, those big R's matter. And in the reserves, they're the only things that matter. So with everybody able to get on board on, on that vision I had, it made the job easy. I mean, it was the best two years. There was a lot of work. And I know, I know the INIs had a lot of work, uh, but bringing things like SharePoint online, those kinds of things that represented uh, the battalion, 
that that earned us, you know, the high maintenance readiness, the high training readiness, um, just the high standards we held, which brought us the Fourth Marine Division Trophy for best battalion in the in the division. Um, those are the things I remember, and it's, I mean, it's 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 all the stories from the from the different kids, whether they were AR reserve or or active duty, uh, that enjoyed their time in the command at a, at a fluid environment uh, where we're still trying to drive two companies in, in, uh, in amphib ops every, every year. Uh, we're still supporting the division. We're still trying to get out, you know, and do gunneries in the spring. I mean, all those things that, that mattered to our readiness. It's, it's those stories that, uh, that I cherish uh, with the full team. Uh, and running into you guys all over the place, and and uh, and uh, you know that's what that's kind of what kept me going um, while I was a top level school, you know, because there I focused my paper, uh, my thesis there I focused on how to better utilize the reserves in support of the active component, and and uh, and get more bang for the buck, if you will, um, sure. and so uh, that was kind of my focus there, um, and then you know I thought. You know, I thought, well, this is great. You know, I, I've got all this time with the reserves. I'm going to, uh, I'm going to throw my hat in the ring for that uh, Northcom billet and really get some control and and try to help the reserves out better. Uh, and then I got a phone call from my mentor who went, yeah, that that's great. Uh, no, you're going to Sancom. Thanks for coming. So uh, I ended up uh, heading down to Tampa after after school. While there, sir, you uh, you served as the J5 Plants Division. Uh, and within months of checking in, you were selected to lead the Central and South Asia branch of J5. Uh, as a branch chief, uh, you had several joint billets, um, combining interagency operational planning teams focused on Operation Freedom Sentinel, and then also the South Asia strategy. So I'm sure you were extremely busy at that time. Yeah. <laughs> you were it, also... It, go, go ahead, sir. No, go ahead, sir. Well, I was going to say is, you know, it's a mouthful. Uh, and... Uh, you know, I owe it to my four-man team because uh, that's who was the main effort at Zencom. Uh, it's me, a uh, lieutenant commander in the Navy, a commander in the Navy, a Marine major, uh, aviation maintenance officer, and a uh, and an Army uh, lieutenant colonel. And so that, that was the team that was uh, in charge as the main effort rewriting the the, uh, the plans for Afghanistan based on the new uh, South Asia strategy, and uh, and then trying to you know, get that done in three months uh, and, and, uh, and get it promulgated out to the force uh, and the interagency. Uh, so we had to have all their buy-in. So, and, you know, anyone who's worked with the interagency, it's like herding cats. So he's got to kind of keep, keep them moving in a direction because uh, no one plans like the military does. So, uh, you know, it was, uh, it, it, was, uh, it was some good times. Uh, don't miss Doha in one bit. Uh, but uh, it's a great place to go and seclude yourself for planning. So uh, it worked out well. And you and your team, sir, you guys were instrumental in planning uh, and maintaining several compartmentalized SECDEF directed planning efforts. And then uh, as possible, probably as a result of that, you were promoted to the rank of Colonel uh, June 3rd, 2019. Yeah, this is all on your back, JR. So, <laughs> I don't believe that for a second, sir. <laughs> no, no, it's all that good work, uh, you know, Anyone who I've served with, and I'm at, in a uniform over 31 years now, but you know I've learned something from everybody, uh, and I got you know I got I got a lot of tankers to thank for uh, for helping me get to where I am, uh, and of course I can't forget the wife, but but you know it's uh, it's I mean I'm a culmination of so many so many different tankers I've crossed paths with. Uh, and learn from, uh, and I just, you know, every day, you know, I'm trying to build on that, uh, keep moving forward. So it, uh, but yeah, being, uh, you know, now being an 06, I mean, it's certainly a different lens. Um, I'm out here, you know, MAGDAF training commence, I'm back in the desert, uh, can't get away from torn on palms. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's, uh, you know, being here at MAGDAF training command is the, uh, as the, uh, lack of a better word, the G3, the, the uh, uh, MAGTAF training director, director uh, work in service level training uh, program uh, and, and maintaining our ranges and our equipment sets out here. It's, uh, 
you know, it's a, it takes a village. Uh, and again, I'm, I'm, I'm lucky to be surrounded by some great individuals within their, in their own MOSs uh, that are bringing it every day. Uh, and, and, you know, that's, you know, that's the, the one thing that I expect from everybody is you, if you're coming to work, you're bringing it every day and you need to buckle in and, and, and get the job done. And sir, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you to look back for your past 31 years. Uh, this channel, as you know, sir, has has a message, and it provides an opportunity to address today's generation of tanker that has to deal with the divestment of armor. And uh, obviously, that message, that that divestment of armor, that that decision that the Marine Corps made, uh, is hard on everybody. Um, it's hard on it's hard on the junior Marines. It's, it's certainly, I'm sure, hard on, on somebody after 31 years. What is your message to these Marines that have to deal with this, sir? Well, I think I think there's I think there's a couple messages, you know. I think I think for the Marines that are still in uniform, uh, and and are staying in the Marine Corps, I think the message is, you're rooted in tanks, and so, but you've got that you've got that tanker mentality, of no more than your no more than the other components of the MAGTA. Uh, my time in tanks that had never changed, whether I was at the platoon level, the company level, the battalion level. Knowing more than our counterparts across the MAGTAF was always critical. So I would ask the, the the tankers that are that are staying in the Marine Corps and moving on to another MOS to attack that MOS with the same tenacity and the same the same attitude as you did as a tanker. Um, now, for some guys, uh, if they were anything like me as a lance corporal or a sergeant, and you're going into Comstrat, you may want to change your lingo a little bit. Uh, however, uh, you know the same tenacity. Uh, regardless of the billet, uh, is what's going to continue to perpetuate you in your career. And then never forget, this is where you came from. I mean, I've, I've run into, you know, before Lieutenant General Dana retired, a former tanker. He'd gone logistics, right? So there are plenty of, plenty of Marines out there that, that you know, have, have moved beyond tanks and, and, uh, and it still produced and provided vital, vital billets to the Marine Corps. And that's every Marine that, that supported the tank community and doesn't have a tank community to go back to. I'd keep driving, keep driving the battle ain't over. Uh, and I'd, I'd, uh, I'd keep pushing. Uh, just because they took this vehicle away from us doesn't mean something ain't gonna pop in another 10 years. Um, you know, and, and so you never know where the Marine Corps is gonna go. This is, uh, this is this next design. And I think as you look at the NDS and, and you look at those things, um, you know, maybe the design is right. I don't like saying that. I'm a tank guy. I mean, I, I like to beat on steel, but, but uh, this is a different time for the Marine Corps, and it's one that's, uh, that for us is, as tanks is historic, uh, and we should pay attention to it and watch it. Um, uh, and, you know, uh, it, it's, it's not going to change much um, for the rest of the Marine Corps, although I haven't run into a single infantry officer that hasn't asked the question, why? Uh, and, you know, even as a tank, even as a colonel, I bring them back to the design uh, and where the current fight's taking us. And so that, that leads us away from uh, our, our, uh, our Abrams model tank. And so, you know, it, uh, you know, it, you know I, I have, you know, personal, personally, you know, my son was at, at MCT when this thing collapsed, right? And so I uh, had signed up as an 1800. Uh, tank crewman to go to Charlie Company fourth tanks, uh, and then you know, schoolhouse is gone. So it's not going to happen, right? And so, um, and so yeah, I mean it's uh, so a legacy that's gone, right? So anybody who anybody else uh, who had uh, sons or daughters that were serving in the tank community that had already previously been in the tank community, you know that that legacy ends now. And I think for us. Uh, for the, like I said, Marines in uniform, keep doing what you're doing. You're just going to do it in another MOS. Maintain the tenacity, maintain the attack every day. Uh, that that will never leave you. I think for the Marines that uh, that are getting out, or even those that are staying in, I think it's incumbent on us as tankers to maintain the maintain the knowledge and the legacy of the tank community. And it's through JR, through elements like this. Where that's going to be able to take place, you know, and then then, then there's these associations uh, that that are are allowing us to maintain uh, that connective tissue uh, to 
those that have served before us, those we served with, um, because let's say at the end of the day, we're the last of the line uh, for now. And so uh, we've got to make sure that uh, that line's continued uh, in some capacities. So whether it's on, on, on channels like yours or it's at reunions, uh, we got to keep those things up. So that, that's, that's kind of my message for, for those that are getting out and moving on or for those that are, uh, those that are still in uniform. I thank you for that, sir. And I, I'm, I'm, I mean, the, the, that's, that's a perfect summation of, of what we need right now. And I certainly appreciate you coming on. Uh, I appreciate the viewers, uh, people that continue to support this channel. Uh, we are continuing to grow. Um, if you've not already done so, please subscribe. Please hit the subscribe button. Hit the notification bell to uh, be notified of new episodes. Um, sir, really, honestly, thank you so very much to make time of your busy schedule to come on here. Uh, what parting comments do you have, sir? Well, one, I wouldn't have missed this for the world. Uh, so thank you for the invite. Uh, I hope uh, I hope you get some more of my counterparts because uh, there are there are I think eleven colonels still in uniform that are tankers, uh, sure. still holding uh, holding that uh, holding that mantle. Um, you know, so uh, and, and to all the uh, to all the guys that came before, I gotta I gotta give some props out, Jr. So if you don't mind, please. You know, it's. Uh, you know, it's important that I, I make sure the guys like, uh, you know, Prevost and Sabinski, uh, I still remember you taking my books when I was at M60 tank school because you thought I was a Russian spy. So, haha. -ha. Uh, you know, uh, I still, you know, all the uh, information I got from Colonel John Lauder as a brand new lieutenant checking into second tanks or biker Dave Neary, uh, the tank leader. Uh, the education I got from guys like Roy Meek uh, and, uh, and, uh, you know, Wild Bill Callahan, Colonel Callahan, uh, Major Scotty West, Russ Jameson, uh, you know, uh, old, uh, old Swift, uh, Major Swift, who I think is up there at, uh, PM, uh, the PM shop now, uh, Leinbach, uh, also retired tanker out there, uh, um, uh, Mitch Arnzen, rest in peace, uh, learned a lot from Mitch. Uh, when he was an h &S company commander, uh, and I was a total platoon commander. Um, you know, and then there's, you know, the master gunner branch. I can't say enough about, I, I, I haven't served with a master gunner that I wouldn't take anywhere with me in my back pocket. Uh, so uh, to all of the master gunners, and I'll be honest with you, there's, there's too many to name, from Waters to, from, you know, Waters to, uh, um, uh, you know, Ryan Hilliard, uh, you know, I, I can't say enough about those guys keeping me out of trouble uh, and educating me uh, every day on the tank. Uh, to the individuals, uh, guys that I knew, uh, you know, like Tom Garcia uh, back in the day or, or uh, uh, Mike Hansen, retired Colonel Mike Hansen, my platoon commander from Desert Storm. Uh, or, you know, very, very plainly, uh, you know, guys like... Uh, Corporal Rivas, who, uh, you know, whenever you ask him how you drive a tank, he'd always reply in a southern drawl like you stole it. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's guys like that that make up our community. And uh, I can't say enough <clears throat> about uh, being able to serve with guys like that and, uh, and put, the, uh, put the steel beast into action. Uh, so, JR, again, thanks for, for giving me the time and letting me come on here and do that. Absolutely, sir. And I'm absolutely honored to have you. Uh, with that, sir, we'll be signing off. All right. Thanks, JR. Semper Fi, sir. Hurrah.